Amen. So the title of the sermon this morning is Humble Beginnings. <clears throat> Humble Beginnings. And I want to just <clears throat> talk about the fact that, you know, we see a lot of uh, uh, great things going on as far as, uh, you know, other churches that we're associated with. Even our own church in Tempe, uh, you know, has grown into a, a big church. You know, they got a lot of people that are doing a great work for God. And, and, you know, that's what we desire to have. But I want to kind of just talk about the fact that, you know, even churches like that, <clears throat> they had a very humble beginning. You know, we, we might go look at uh, the, the church up in Tempe and say, wow, you know, why, why don't we have this? Why, when, when are we going to get all this? All the people and all the work and the bigger space and everything else that comes along with that. But what we have to understand is that, that it hasn't always been that way. You know, that church is a church that started out literally in somebody's living room, you know, the pastor's living room, and grew out of that space over time. And it took years, you know, and even after that, you know, it was a slow growth. And things that are going to be deep-rooted and established and solid are going to stand the test of time are things that take time to grow, okay? And I'm going to talk, you know, not so much more about churches, but just more generally speaking, you know, if we're going to be people that are going to do something for God in our lives to, to, to whatever capacity, whatever role we fulfill, uh, we have to understand that humility plays a big part in that. You know, we need to make sure that we're coming from a place of humility when it comes to to serving God. We always may have to, should never shy away or uh, feel, uh, you know, ashamed or, uh, you know, get discouraged by the fact that maybe we have to start out with humble beginnings, whether it's as a church, whether it's as uh, an individual and just serving God. And we see examples of this throughout Scripture. We're going to look at a few of some of God's greatest men, like Moses, who started out very humbly, who had very humble beginnings and over, you know, with Moses, literally, you know, decades went by before he's finally used mightily of God. You know, we think about Moses, we think about the Red Sea, we think about the, you know, the ten plagues, we think about, you know, Mount Sinai and the pillar of fire. We think about all the great things that Moses did, the rock, you know, the serpent, everything, just all the things that he did. But what we sometimes forget is that he started out very humbly. You know, he started out with a very, you know, an existence of being basically somebody who was an unknown you know, fleeing from Egypt, as we read the story here. You know, he, he attempted at the beginning of, you know, uh, his life there, about 40 years of age, he attempted to go out, you know, and, and try to, and to start a work for God, to be associated with the people of God, and to lead. And we read the story this morning about what happened, right? He goes out, it says in verse 11, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, <clears throat> that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. He spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, you know, and that's a good sign right there whenever, you know, that's a little, that's a little self-defense tip right there. If you're talking to somebody, they start doing this, you know, you better, you, you know, you should probably, you know, pay attention to what their next moves are going to be, you know. So anyway, I just, I just thought I'd throw that in there. But it says, you know, he looked this way and that way, and he saw there was no man. He slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And he went out the second day, and behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, why smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So he goes from being Pharaoh's you know, son to being a fugitive, right? Because he tried to go out and do something. And, and again, you know, his motivation was noble. I don't know that you know, killing this Hebrew was the right thing to do. You know, it's murder, basically, you know, but his, his motive was, was pure. He, you know, he wanted to help the people of God. He saw that God's people were being oppressed. I mean, at this point in his life, he was, you know, he narrowly escaped being thrown into the river himself. So we see that the Egyptians are already, you know, repressing God's people, oppressing them, and persecuting them. So though his motivation was noble, though his desire was right, that he wanted to serve God, he wanted to do something big for God, he had some other lessons to learn. You can go over to Exodus chapter 3, but I'll read from Hebrews 11. It says in Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. So again, his motives were right. Okay, He was uh, chose rather to suffer affliction. You know, he didn't esteem uh, the, 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 he esteemed the, the, the reproach of Christ greater than what the riches and treasures of, of Egypt. And that's a good motive. You know, that's good that when we get saved and we want to 
you know, separate from the world, get the sin out of our lives, and be, live a godly life for Christ, you know, that's a great motive, isn't it? You know, that's something we should want for our lives. But, you know, there's other lessons that we have to learn along the way. We can't just step out and say, okay, now I'm ready to set the world on fire for God. You know, there's lessons that God has to teach us along the way. And probably the, one of the biggest lessons that we have to learn, if you don't get this down, is humility. And that's why we see Moses here, you know, he, has to, he flees and dwells in the land of Midian, and he, what, sat down by a well. You know, he goes from this great, probably a very, you know, lofty position in Egypt to just this, he's out in, the, out in the sticks, you know, in some strange land, just hanging out by a well. His motives are right, but God had some other lessons for him to learn. You look there in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. So that's what he ended up doing. He ends up being a shepherd. And it's interesting how many people that God has used that have had that exact role. And I believe, you know, part of that reason is because, uh, you know, we see that kind of translate to a spiritual shepherd later. You know, God had likens pastors and elders unto, unto spiritual shepherds, right? So he's kind of showing us, you know, it's kind of, it's just an interesting, you know, thread through the scripture that you see these men that we're going to look at several of them that they're, they're consistently using, what, shepherds, okay? That's not really the thrust of the, of the sermon here, but it says here, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now, we think, you know, we always like to think about that, that beautiful oil painting of, you know, the guy leading his flock through some beautiful green valley down to some, you know, well-watered brook, and he's, it's just this peaceful, serene scene. That's not really being a shepherd. You know, if you, if you want to you know, being a shepherd isn't just this nice, you know, tiptoe, tiptoe through the tulips. It's, it's a lot of hard work. You know, when we go out onto the reservation, the Navajo reservation, they still do this. They do have a lot of flocks, even, uh, well, anyway, you go out there and they're riding around on four wheelers. They're in the dust, they're in the heat, you know, they're trying to get these animals to go where they need them to go, crossing line. It's, it's a lot of really hard work, right? It's a, it's not just this, this rom overly romanticized position that, a lot of people have, you know, in their minds today about being a shepherd or something like that. You know, back in the day, that was something that, you know, you would, you would go do because, you know, you weren't going to see anybody. Maybe it was the guy you didn't want around, you know, you're kind of like, who, which, which sibling, which child do we not like the most? Let's go send them out for, you know, days on end out in the, into the wilderness, right? <clears throat> and, you know, they kind of see that here with, we're going to, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you see that a little bit with David, which is another guy we're going to talk about in a second. But it says there that he kept the, uh, the, the flock of Jethro, his father, on the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. I mean, this is where Moses is. This is where we find him all these years later. And he came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. You know, and God had some lessons to teach him. Of course, we can see the foreknowledge of God in this. You know, Mount Oreb, these are that mountain range we're in is Mount Sinai, which plays a very significant part. You know, that's where the fire came down, the Lord came down. Ten Commandments were given. So you can see how the Lord is kind of using him to show him the land, give him the lay of the land so that he would know where to lead the children of Israel, how to navigate that, that landscape and get to the promised land. But, you know, I'm sure it wasn't a lot of fun in the meantime. I'm sure it wasn't a lot of fun for Moses just following, you know, these, these animals around, having to deal with all that, and, you know, in the, literally in a desert. You know, we wouldn't want to just go wander aimlessly in the desert. I mean, we'll do it when we go soul winning, but, you know, there's a purpose behind it. Right? But we, don't want, we wouldn't just go wandering around out in the desert for days on end. You know, we would want to seek shelter. We would want to get out of the heat and everything. But that was his life. You know? And you have to think about how humbling that must have been for Moses to go from Pharaoh's son-in-law or Pharaoh's uh, stepson or son, whatever you want to call it, going from that to what? Just this, this shepherd in this strange land. Very humbling. Right? But we know that he went on to do great things. But what did he start out with? Humble beginnings. Right? There was humility that needed to be learned before he could do anything for God. And it says that he led the flock to the backside of the desert. So he was leading these, the, this flock, right? So, and that was kind of his training. You know, he is going to be a leader of God's people. He's going to lead another, you know, millions of people through these, through these deserts, literally, you know, shepherding them along, you know, keeping them on the right path. And this is a principle that we could see in Scripture is that, you know, if you want to be a leader, you know, whether it's you want to go into the ministry or whether you want to be a leader at work, whether you want to lead in the home, whatever, if, if you're going to be in any type of leadership, you know, we have, le leaders learn by serving others. Leaders learn by being followers. How, you know, people ask, you know, how do I learn about leadership? You know, what's a good way for me to learn 
uh, to be a leader. Be a follower. Learn, you know, follow somebody who is leading. You know, that's usually a good way to learn how to lead. You know, find somebody else that's doing it and take note of what they're doing, you know, for better or worse. You might say, hey, I, you know, th this is really good what they're doing here. And, you know, maybe I would do this differently, whatever. Okay, but, you know, what we see here is that Moses is in the backside of the desert leading a flock for somebody else. It's not his flock. It's Jethro's. It's his father-in-law's. It's not even his, an his animals. And he ends up later leading God's people because leaders, they learn to lead by doing what? By serving other people. You know, the best leaders are people that are usually the best followers. Good followers make good leaders. And people who do not follow well will not make good leaders. It's just a fact. <clears throat> Moses and, you know, others, they had this, this similar occupation. If you want to go over to 1 Samuel chapter 16 of what? The similar occupation of leading sheep, of, ser of following other people's animals, of taking care of, uh, of serving in that way. We don't just see them jump right into being used of God. We see them in this very humble position of, you know, literally being a shepherd. You're going to 1 Samuel 16, but it says in Amos, you know, that prophet and the minor prophets, Amos 7, he says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman. So, you know, Amos is being used to go preach the word of God, to rebuke Israel. And, he's, and when he gets, he's saying, look, who was I? You know, I wasn't a prophet's son. You know, I wasn't prophet. You know, I didn't come from some great lineage of preachers. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with, you know, being a prophet's son, being a preacher's son, and going into that yourself. You know, I'm not against that. But what we do see Am Amos saying is that, you know, who am I? You know, what, what is it to, to you know, what, what pedigree do I have, you know, that I should go and preach the word of God? He said, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock. So when did God come get Amos? As he followed the flock. As he was one that was following, Amos was taken by the Lord, and he said unto him, go prophesy unto my people Israel. So again, good leaders, they start out by doing what? By following. And I love the picture there in Amos where he says, I followed the flock. You know, we are considered a flock. That's, you know, the, 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 Jesus literally called us our, his little flock, right? He called us his sheep. You know, Paul said to, the, to the, uh, the Ephesians, to the elders, to what? To feed the flock of God, right? And I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's a great picture of, you know, if you are one that desires to go into ministry, if you are somebody that wants to serve in the local church to whatever degree, you know, you need to learn to do what? To follow the flock. You know, to be one that goes along with the program at the local church and not be somebody that's always fighting it, going against it, always trying to be contrary to what the church is trying to do. He's followed the flock, and then the Lord took him and said, go prophesy unto my people. You're there in 1 Samuel 16, another great man of God that was used mightily. We think of King David, slew Goliath, you know, defeated the Philistines, was the, you know, reigned over all Israel, you know, did all these great works for God, you know, set up. The, prepared the way for Solomon to build God's temple. I mean, he did all these great things, but is that where he started out? No, he again, like Moses, had what? Humble beginnings, very humble beginnings. He said in uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? So remember, Samuel comes to anoint the first king, right? And, and Jesse brings all seven sons before, or not all seven, he brings, he brings his, uh, his sons before him, and he leaves out one. And it's like he doesn't even think to bring them. Or he thought of him, he's like, but the, he's got such a low reputation of David, the youngest, it just says, well, it's, there's no way it's David. You know, it's probably one of these other sons of mine. And he said, are here all thy children? He said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And you can see, again, there's this kind of, this, this disdain for people who, are, it's kind of like, well, but he's keeping sheep. Obviously, you're not going to use somebody who keeps sheep. You know, you're going to want somebody who's been, you know, uh, keeping the records, or somebody who's been, you know, working hard, doing this or that, or doing some other more noble, you know, uh, important job than just following dumb animals around, right? He's saying, and that's kind of his attitude. He said, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till we come hither. So again, very humble beginnings for David, right? But we see this again, that that is God who, who God uses. Not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a shepherd, but it has to, you know, we see this principle of, People coming from very humble beginnings before God begins to use them, even having to go through seasons of serving others. And uh, this is something that, 
God reminds David of. I, you can go over to go over to um, go over to First Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one. God re later reminds David of this in First Chronicles, and we'll see it in Second Samuel too. He said, "Now therefore, thus thou shalt say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people." He's saying, "Look, I took thee from the sheep coat. You know, I took you from the pen. I took you from following them." I took you from following the sheep that thou mayest, you know, be a reign of, ruler over my people. God, you know, and I believe there's a lot of lessons that David learned as he was following the sheep that made him the, the, the ruler that he was, that made him the king that he was. God uses people that have humble beginnings. And I'm just going to say this, if you don't have humility, God's not going to use you. I don't, I don't care how many, if you dot all the I's and cross all the T's, if you are proud and lifted up and you lack humility, God will not use you. God requires humility. And we'll see why here in a second. Look at there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. You say, oh, that's Old Testament. God doesn't work like that anymore. He's looking for the brightest and the best, right? Not really. <laughs> Look at verse 26. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He's not, you know, the church isn't filled this morning with, you know, the senators and the state representatives. They'd probably be in so much sin they wouldn't be allowed in anyway. You know, but it's not filled with all the, the, the big brains and the, and the, you know, not, you know, we have, obviously we have people at all different degrees of intellect and intelligence. And it's not that, you know, you have to be dumb to come to church or something like that, but this is just how it plays out in life is that God doesn't look for like what the world would consider you know, these, these great, mighty people. Because those people lack humility. That's the problem. That's the problem with them. You know, if there was some guy who had some huge IQ, you know, was just in, super intelligent, you know, and, you know, very successful, and had humility and loved the Lord, yeah, he could be used by God. But that's typically not how it goes, does it? It's people that, you know, have had uh, more humble beginnings in life. People who work more menial jobs, people who are just trying to scratch out a living in life that God tends to use. People who are just shepherds, people who are just trying to survive, people who are just trying to raise a family. That's who God tends to use. Why? Because those are the people that typically have humility. And that's what God's looking for. It's not about intellect. It's not about bankroll. It's not about looks. It's about humility. And God is looking for people who have that. God uses people with humble beginnings. He uses people who are not many wise, not after the flesh, right? They're not wise to the things of this world. Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. What the world would look at and say, well, you know, they're a nobody. That's who God has chosen. He's using the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen Yea, and things which are not. What has God chosen? Things that have what? Humble beginnings. Things that the world would esteem very low. People whose station in life is not, you know, some, some uh, you know, grand, exalted position in the world that, that, pe that the world's going to exalt. It's people who, who are, you know, despised, the base things. Those are the things that God has chosen to bring them not the things that are. Why? Verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, why does God use the, 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 the more foolish things, you know, according to the world? Why does God use the weak and the base things? Because those things are the things that are going to give God the glory. Those are the ones that are going to give God the glory. They're not going to say, yeah, I did this. You know, I, I, I'm the one that built this church. You know, I built, you know, Faithful Word, and I did it. No, God did it. And God did it through His people. You know, and of course, God gives leadership to guide and direct. But, you know, God is the one that builds the church. That's what he, he does that. It's through his word. You know, if people, if the preaching of God's word changes people's hearts and their lives and they, and they start living for the Lord and give glory to God, you know, what credit is that to, to the preacher? It's the word of God that did the work. It's the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. That's what's going to change hearts. It's not, you know, it's not some, you know, eloquent speaking of mine, you know, obviously. <laughs> Right? I'm sure I don't have to convince you of that this morning. Right? It's not because I'm just some great orator or something that I can move, move people with my words and demeanor. It's because the Word of God has power. You know, and I like it that way because that gives me confidence because I know the truth about me. 
that I, you know, I'm not some great speaker, that I'm not some powerful, you know, motivational speaker. I'm not, this isn't Tony Robbins up here, okay? I'm not going to get up and move everybody to tears from Sunday to Sunday. You know, maybe I can squeak one out every once in a while that, <laughs> that is, you know, worth listening to a second time. But this is just the day in and day out grind of the ministry, and I'm glad that God's Word is the one that does all the lifting for me. That if I just preach that and leave the Holy Spirit to it, He'll work on people's hearts. And you know what? I don't, but I'm not, in turn, I'm not going to sit back and say, well, look what I've done. Of course you've cleaned up. Of course you're doing this. Of course you're living for it. I mean, I'm the preacher here, right? Of course you would, right? No, it's God's word that did it. And what God gets the glory for that. And I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for building this church. You know, and we just need to focus on not losing sight of the fact that God wants humility in each and every one of us. And that having humble beginnings as a church, like this, I mean, this is pretty humbling this morning. <laughs> right? You know, one third of your audit space is gone. You're like, oh, it looks like a full house. No, it's the same amount of people, pretty much. It's just we're all crammed in here right now, okay? You know, when, when the floods and you're, you're, you're wondering about your space, you know, that can be a little humbling. But you know what? God uses things that have humble beginnings. If, if, if we're struggling with this, you know, need I remind you of our original location? That was some humble beginnings, you know. That was, you know, those chairs and everything. I won't go on and on about that. But that's who God uses, humble people who are going to give him the glory. <clears throat> You know, there's other examples we can look at. Go back, keep something in 1 Corinthians 1, but go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 3. Second thing, 2 Kings, I'm sorry, go to Exodus 17. Exodus 17. Exodus chapter number 17. You know, David is one that started with humble beginnings and then was used mightily by God. You know, he started out as a shepherd, became, you know, the king of Israel. You know, he did great things for God, wrote large sections of the scriptures, and he used mightily. But what did he say when he was uh, told that he could build the house, that he would, uh, could prepare the, the way for, for Solomon to build the house of God? He said, who am I, and what is my house that thou hast led me hitherto? He didn't say, well, it's about time you recognized how great I am, Lord. It's about time you recognized how I pulled myself up from the sheep coat and got right, and, and has been faithful all these years. No, he said, who am I? And what is my house, you know, that I should, uh, you know, be used of you? You know, every time I read that verse, it, I always, it's, it's always, you know, and I see other people, that verse hits people. That's one of those verses where it's just when you hear David say that, who am I and what is my house? Like, we could think about that probably for ourselves. You know, if we've gotten saved and we're living for the Lord and we're winning souls and we're going to church, we're doing, we're living for God, and all that encompasses, Right? We might find ourselves saying that. Who am I? You know, well, where was I headed? What was my life going to amount to in terms of, you know, spiritual worth before God got involved and took me from a sheep coat? Or rather, put me in a sheep coat, maybe. You know, that's probably the more, uh, more applicable example. That's really what's going on, is God has put us in the sheep coat. This is the humble beginnings, okay? But there's several examples of this. We looked at Moses. We'll come back to Moses in a little bit, but um, we also, the other example would be that of Joshua. You know, or you could also talk about uh, uh, Elijah, right, or Elisha. Elisha was known when he got anointed, or not anointed, but when, when Elijah cast his mantle upon him and he went to follow him, you know, Elisha, you don't hear from Elisha for a very long time. You don't hear anything about him. And then you hear about him in, in, in uh, 2 Kings 3, and it says, uh, Jehoshaphat said, is there, yet, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that may, we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king's, uh, one of, the kings of, Israel's ser uh, king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elijah, the son of Shaphat, that great, mighty, powerful prophet of God that everybody knows. Right? No, he said, Here is the Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water in the hands of Elijah. I mean, that was his reputation. That's all that's people, Elijah who? Oh, you know the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know, because that, that's kind of a humbling job, don't you think? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this preacher. You know, Elisha's thinking, I'm going to go with Elijah. I'm going to see all these miracles. And he's going to do great works. He's going to teach me all this cool stuff. I'm going to learn how to preach. I'm going to learn how to just, you know, tear it up, call on fire from heaven. You know, he sees all these things that Elijah does, right, or hears about him. He's thinking, yeah, all right. And you know, he did eventually get that. He did get that double portion of that spirit, right? But what came before that? Humble beginnings, going unknown. Even to the point where when he is in the ministry, when he is the man, 
people are still saying, oh, it's the guy who poured water on the hands of Elijah, right? He started out just, you know, he gets with Elijah, and, and I don't know why I always have it in my mind that Elijah might have been a bit of a cantankerous guy. I don't know that he was like the easiest guy to get along with. I don't know why that's in my, just because he's such a, a raw preacher, you know, and everything he does, you think, man, this guy's probably pretty intense, right? And you just think about Elijah just being, all right, Elijah, what, what's, what's on the, What's on the schedule today? We're going to call down some fire? He's like, why don't you go get some water? i got to eat. You know, and you can pour some water in my hands so I can clean them. Oh, anything else? No, that's it. And bring a towel so I can dry myself off later. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty humbling, isn't it? But that's what Elisha did. You know, he was just his servant. He was just there helping out where he could, jumping in where he could, helping the man of God. And that was a very humble beginning. But you know what? That's what makes good leaders is people who can do menial, humble tasks that aren't just in it to be in the limelight, that aren't just in it to, you know, make a name for themselves. And you don't see Elisha in 2 Kings saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I used to pour the water in, but that's not me anymore. You call me Elisha, you know, the man of God. You know, he, that was a name that he probably didn't mind. You know, another a great example of this, you know, whenever I think about this topic is uh, Joshua. You know, when people... People that are going to be great leaders have to start out as great followers first. They need humility. It says in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses and Aaron. and Ur. So you got Moses just kind of telling him what to do, right? And why is that? Go over to... Uh, Go over to Joshua chapter number one, Joshua chapter number one. Because Joshua, who went on, has a whole book in the Bible named after him, who led the children of Israel into the promised land and, and defeated the Canaanites and established Israel and divided the land among the 12 tribes. That was a great work, something that was intended for Moses to do originally. But we know through his disobedience and God used, and made an example out of him, we know the story. Joshua was the one that ends up going in there and doing that. But what was he up leading up to that point? It's just a servant. He was being told what to do there in Exodus 17, but it also says in Exodus 24, and Moses rose up and his minister, Joshua. That's what Joshua was to Moses. He was his minister. And Moses went up into the mount. Exodus 33, again, it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again to the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. So again, it's just this pattern over and over again that you see in the Scripture when it comes to people who are being used of God, when, specifically, you know, leaders, people that are going to be leaders. They start out very humbly. They start out as servants. They start out as people who are following the flock, keeping other people's sheep, people who are serving other people, serving other leaders that are, yes, in the ministry, but in, in a subservient capacity. They are there to minister to the minister in a way. He said in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, or you're in, did I have you go to Exodus? I had you go to Joshua 1. Joshua 1, verse 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Notice that. It's not like once you become a leader, you're your own man. You're still somebody's servant. He's just the servant of the Lord. He might, you know, Elijah, Elisha for a long time might have been the guy that poured waters on the, on the hands of Elijah, but eventually he became Elisha, the man of God. You know, eventually he did step into that role but after he learned the lessons that came with humble beginnings. It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. So you get this, you know, Moses is the servant of the Lord, and then Joshua is Moses' minister, saying, My servant Moses is dead, now therefore rise, go to this Jordan, thou and all this people. Go to Joshua 24. And look, people, people can get discouraged by that, you know, and... and and I think part of the reason why God does things this way is to discourage people that shouldn't be in leadership. People that can't handle going through this should not be in leadership. People who can't submit to other people, take directions, take correction, should not be in, in leadership. Because they won't know how to dole it out. They won't know how to dole it out when the time comes, with humility, with tact, or being very stern when appropriate. They won't know how to do that if they themselves have not been subjected to the same. And, you know, Joshua went through that. Joshua's following Moses around. I mean, and I don't, I don't see how you could get disgruntled in Joshua's position. I mean, to follow Moses around would have been pretty cool. I mean, to see everything, to be, you know, rubbing shoulders with a guy like that and seeing everything that he did, it would have been awesome. 
But eventually, you know, Joshua, who's known as the minister of Moses, the minister of Moses, Moses' servant, all through the scriptures, eventually does become known, like Moses was, who also started out, you know, as, as Je keeping Jethro's flock, eventually becomes known as the servant of the Lord. He graduates into that position, right? It says in Joshua 24, verse 29, it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. So yes, as a young man, he started out as Moses' minister, but then he steps into that role to lead the children of Israel in, and through having a, his, accomplished his own works and proving his own work and doing, you know, he is known as the servant of the Lord. He eventually proves himself in that position. But what happens? What ha you know, why does God do it this way? Why does God have leaders start out as servants? Why does he require humble beginnings? You know, whether it's in the role of an individual or a church. You know, this church is starting out with very humble beginnings. And as the Lord builds this church and as it grows and we continue to do more and more works for God, God is only going to get what? More glory. That's why God does that. That's why God has people start out with humble beginnings. So they don't forget, so that they stay humble all the way through, so then God can begin to exalt people. You know, so it doesn't go to their head. You know, Joshua spent so much time being Moses' servant. Elisha spent so much time being Elijah's servant. David spent so much time in the sheep coat. Moses spent 40 years wandering around in the backside of the desert keeping Jethro's sheep that when all those men finally graduated to the place of being used mightily by God, it didn't go to their head. You know, that's why I think it's so important for people to just get in a local church and just serve faithfully and, just, and not get so caught up in what's going to happen 10 years from now. Not get so caught up in, in, in what they're going to do. Well, why don't you just, you know, make sure you can get here, you know, to the next service, the next Sunday, and, and, and do what needs to do week in, week out, and, and live for God day in, day out. And just like I was preaching uh, last Thursday, you know, trust the Lord with all thine heart, and he shall direct thy paths. Just be faithful, be humble, serve God, and he will lead you, and he will guide you. And he'll, get the, and he'll end up getting all the glory for what's accomplished. That's, that's why God does it that way. <clears throat> Mo, you know, Moses and David, they, all, they responded to the call of God with humility. And I already talked about this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where he said, you know, <clears throat> O Lord, what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? That's what he said. You know, that was their response with humility. Are you, are you still in Exodus? You're, no, I had you in Joshua. Go back to Exodus chapter 3. It's interesting that both these men have a similar reaction. You know, when, they've, when the God has begun to use them mightily, when God's telling them about the things that he's going to do with them, they respond with humility. Why? Because humility has been ingrained into their character. You know, that, that's the thing about humility. It's not something you can fake. And, and people that fake it, you know, are, it's usually not a good sign. <laughs> people that feign humility, it's usually because they're, you know, they're either hyper-spiritual or... They're trying to convince people there's something they're not. It could be even very, you know, they could be uh, malicious people a lot of times, right? They're trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. But what I'm getting at is this, is that when Moses spent so much time in that desert, you know, David spent so much time in that sheep coat, but when it came time for God to begin to use them, humility was just ingrained in them. It was just part of their nature. They didn't have to turn it on. It was just who they were. You know, and, and a lot of people don't get there because, you know, a lot of times it, t it means getting beat down a little bit and about getting humbled. You know, how do, I, how, do I, how do I grow in humility? Well, a lot of times you just have to get humbled. And a lot of times it's, you know, life has to do it to us. The Lord has to do it to us. Other people have to come along and, and take us down a notch sometimes. So a lot of people don't last when it comes to that. A lot of people don't last in, in churches that preach the whole counsel of the Word of God because eventually something comes their way that's hard and hits real close to home, and if they're proud, and if they're puffed up, and if they lack humility, you know, they're out the door, and you never see them again. You know, that happens all the time. You know, we, we haven't seen a lot of it here. You know, I don't know that we've seen any of it, but I guarantee if you stick around long enough, you're going you're gonna to start going, well, where's so-and-so? You know, what happened to them? You know, and sometimes people leave for other reasons, but I'm telling you, if people who lack humility, they will not make it serving God. They won't make it living for the Lord. Because it's all about giving him the glory. It's not about getting, you know, accolades or recognition for ourselves. It's about bringing glory to God. And some people can't handle that. They have to be the, they have to be in the limelight. 
That's why humility is essential. And that's why God, you know, put Moses through that testing, that trial. That's why God led him into 40 years of servitude in a desert, right, to teach him humility. And by the time he comes and says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, where you are, and says, let's go get my people. Let's go do what you want to do originally. Look at his reaction. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, like you wanted to do 40 years ago, <laughs> like you wanted to do all those years ago. Remember that? But now he's got a kind of a change of, of heart here. He's kind of thinking, well, I'm kind of comfortable, whatever. And Moses said unto God, who am I? that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And I believe that's coming from a genuine place of humility, that Moses wasn't just trying to, you know, skirt, the, that he's just trying to get out of the doing it. He's probably just a very humble man. He's just thinking, well, who am I? You know, I tried that once before, and it didn't go so well. You know, who am I? I'm just a sheep. I'm just keeping sheep. I'm, I mean, I live in the desert. Who am I to go into Egypt and do this? Well, God's saying, well, you're the perfect guy because you're the, you, you, you're the person who thinks... You're the least capable. You're the one who thinks you have such a low opinion of yourself and when it comes to doing this job. You're perfect, Moses. You're exactly who I want because when I do use you and when I do do those miracles, you're going to give me the glory for it. You're going to make sure that all the glory goes to God. <clears throat> See, that's why humility is absolutely essential when it comes to being in leadership and, and serving others because, you know, that's what leadership is. You know, that's what leadership is. You know, what you want to talk about in a church or any other setting, leadership is serving other people. Because what is it? It's leading. And, and leading is just helping other people, guiding them along, telling, you know, showing them a way, you know, that they, got, they need to go. Showing them how to live, you know, preaching to them the word of God, saying this is what the Bible says, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. You know, that's what leadership is. I mean, in a job, that's what it is. You know, the manager is there to make sure everybody else gets their job done. It's serving them. Right, helping them to accomplish their job. That's what leadership is. Leadership isn't this position where you just get to stand up and, you know, just bask in the limelight and just have people praise you for how great you are. That's not it at all. And if that's what you're in it for, you're going to fail because there's no humility there. Leadership is l serving other people. That's why it takes humility to do it. Go over to uh, go over to First Peter chapter five. I'll wrap it up here in a minute. But First Peter chapter five, you know, humility is something that the Bible brings up over and over again. I'm going to read to you a few verses why you go to First Peter five. It says in Proverbs 15, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. You know, people want to be honored. They want the position. They want to be lifted up. They want to be exalted. But what they need to understand is that humility comes first. You know, humility doesn't come after honor. It comes before it. People aren't going to get lifted up. People aren't going to be put into places of leadership, at least they shouldn't be, until they've proven themselves to have some humility about them. Because, again, it's all about serving other people. The Bible says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. You know, haughty is proud, puffed up, lift up, arrogant. That's what the heart of man is, what, before destruction. You know, pride goeth before a fall right? And honor is before, and before honor is humility. So it's just, you know, when the Bible repeats itself about things, it's because he wants us to get something through our heads, is that before honor is humility, you know, and it's, and, and like I've heard it said, the way up is down. It's, it's, it's a paradox. You know, it's, 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 it seems backwards, right? What do you mean the way up is down? If you want to be exalted, if you want God to use you, you have to be humble. You have to abase yourself. You have to be, uh, you have, have humility. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. So humility and the fear of the Lord, these are the things that are going to allow God to use us because when humility comes first, then the honor can come without the danger of being lifted up and being puffed up. So humility comes first. <clears throat> and why is that? You know, why is it? Well, if you noticed when I was reading those verses, it's the fear of the Lord and is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. And, and again, the, uh, by humility and the fear of the Lord. You see how humility and the fear of God are mentioned in the same breath more than once. It's, it, they go together. <clears throat> That's because if you'll, be, if you'll be humble before God, you know, you're going to be humble before other people. You know, That's the humility that we're talking about. That's the humility, 
not just this, this fake show of humility, but a, a real genuine humility before God that nobody else sees. You know, that because that humility is what translates into humility before other people. And that's what we need. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna serve other people, if you're gonna lead in whatever capacity, you have to have humility before God because that's what you need to do to, in order to serve other people. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, you're in 1 Peter 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, that submitting ourselves one to another is what? Humility. You know, sometimes it takes humility to submit to another fellow brother or sister in Christ, doesn't it? You know, that, that could be a real, you know, that could maybe that could be a stumbling block for, for me. You know, somebody else gets some other soul winning time or they've, they've, they've taken charge of some other ministry in the church and, you know, I'm on their time now. I show up to their soul winning time and they're saying, okay, deacon, go over here and knock these doors. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I'll go knock those doors. <laughs> go knock the exact same doors, right? But, you know, that, that could be a thing, right? And, and, and I'm just using that as an example. And, and, you know, that's a real sign of humility is, is when you can show, it doesn't matter who's telling you what to do as long as it's to the glory of God, it's for the work of God. Who does it matter who it comes from? It shouldn't matter. It's, it's for the work of God, okay? So we should be willing to submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now the elder there, you know, that is just talking about somebody who is older, Okay? And, you know, typically, of course, you know, we could say, we could, you know, say, well, spiritually, you know, there could be people who are older spiritually and the younger spiritual people could submit, you know, to them and get advice and help from them. And that's, that's a perfectly good application. Okay. But let's not forget the other application here is that younger people should submit themselves under elder people. Young people should be kind and respectful to their elders. And I don't care who it is. I don't care, you know, if they, and this is, this is I'm going to park it here for a minute because this is important because we have a lot of young people in here and we have some older people, okay? <laughs> and it's important that this dynamic is not lost. It's important, okay? And he says, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the el elder. You know, that, having respect for your elders, that's not something that just, well, I'm, I've been saved longer, you know, or I do more in the church, you know, or I'm on a better path or I, you know, whatever, that, that you can't just uh, use that as an excuse to be disrespectful to older people in the church. You know, just by even, you know, this will help you out in the world, by the way. Just carry this out into the world, too, because this is lost in the world. They, you go to, go, to job, go to the job with what I'm about to teach you here, and, and it'll, you'll, you'll be a standout. You know, and God, you say, well, you're making a big deal out of it. Well, you know, but God makes a big deal out of it. We won't go there, but it says in Leviticus 19, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. And the hoary head means white. You know, the hoar frost. It's talking about the white hair, right? The gray-headed man. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I mean, he puts that in this. And it's, it's Leviticus, and it's a thou shalt. It's not, you know, a suggestion. This is a commandment from God. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. I mean, if you took that to the very... Uh, literal, most literal sense, and just started standing up when somebody else that was older walked in the room. When your boss at work, who's got you know decades on you, walked in the room instead of just casually looking up to your phone and going, "What's up?" You walk in the phone and just, you walk. He walks in the building and you're just like, "What's up?" And he, you're, he, his, he might not say it, but his thoughts of you just went, "Woo!" His esteem for you just is way down here, and he's not going to expect much from a guy like that. But man, you put that thing away. I don't know why you're on phone at work anyway. <laughs> you know, but if you if you stood up, hey, yes, sir, at attention, ready to go. What do you need? And we're respectful and 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 appreciative. You know, that would go a long way because this is something that's lacking today, and that's why I'm kind of parking it here for a minute. You know, a big you know people who cannot submit unto the elder just on the basis of age alone lack humility. There's a lack of humility there. There's a pride. There's an arrogancy that needs to get checked if you cannot humble yourself to somebody simply because of the fact that they're older. Okay, that, that, that's something that needs to get said. You know, the hoary head, it says in Proverbs 13, 16, is a crown of glory. The hoary head is a crown of glory. If it be found in the way of righteousness. Okay, if it be found, meaning it doesn't matter what somebody's past is, if they are 
found in the way of righteousness, and they, you know, and they have the hoary head, that's like twofold. That's twofold the honor. You know, you got a brother or sister in Christ that is, you know, a, a, an elder to you, and they're living for the Lord. You know, they are worthy of your respect, and and they deserve it. I'm going to move on from that. I got uh, just a few other things to say, but let's go over to. Uh, Go back to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3. So that's just a practical example of humility, you know, in the local church. And we could talk about other ones. You know, we could talk about, you know, being willing to submit ourselves one to another in, in all manner of ways, you know. But we should never have this, this haughty, arrogant spirit that just thinks that nobody can tell me what to do. I don't care who it is. You know, we, we, should, we should love one another. We should be, as the Bible says, we're going to look at it in a minute, clothed with humility. That should be something, well, that's where, you know, we were. But it says we should be clothed with humility. That's what it said in 1 Peter 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the other. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I mean, do you want God to fight you in life or do you want God to give you grace? I don't know about you, but I prefer grace. In fact, I need it. <laughs> I find myself often needing the grace of God in my life. So I make, you know, one way that you could secure that, and if you're anything like me, you need it too. One thing what you could do in order to secure that is to, uh, you know, be clothed with humility and, and, and to not be what? Proud. Because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You can see how important humility is. God's not, God resists proud people. God is not going to use proud people. It's not just that he's going to put them on the shelf and say, well, I can't use you. He's going to actively resist you. I mean, that's, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of people I don't want to get in, into a scuffle with, but God's on the top of that list. And there, if there's one person I don't want to tangle with, it's the Lord, okay? Because uh, that should be pretty obvious why, right? So if we want the grace of God, we need to be humble people. And by the way, you know, that resistance, a lot of times, is God trying to humble you. You know, if you keep running into that, that resistance, if it feels like God's fighting you, it's probably because he's trying to humble you. He's trying to take you down a notch. So, you know, the goal of leadership is the glory of God and the edification of his people. That is the goal of leadership. The goal of leadership is not to exalt itself. It's not to make itself seem like it's, you know, all that in a bag of chips. It's not to get the, you know, the praise of man. It's not to, it's to exalt itself. What is the goal of leadership? It's to, to, to bring glory to God and to edify his people. So you can see why humility is so important, that it can't be about self. It can't be about the person doing the leading. It has to be about the glory of God. And it's interesting, are you in Exodus 3? Is that Moses gets brought back to the place of his humble beginnings. I already talked about this earlier in the sermon, but it says he kept the, fle the verse 1, he kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mount of God, even to Oreb. So it's interesting that that's where he started out. That was his humble beginning. But when he, after God, if he goes into Egypt and God uses him mightily and God, uh, you know, does all those miracles and delivers, uses Moses to deliver his people from Egypt miraculously and brings them through the Red Sea, he brings them back to the same place. And there he is exalted. You know, he was, Moses was one who was humbled in private. You know, 40 years by himself in the desert was a, probably a very humbling thing. But nobody was there to see that. No one was there to, to behold Moses' you know, uh, humility. But Moses was there. And he later returns to that same place, go to Exodus 19. He later returns to Oreb as what? A great leader. I mean, I challenge you to find a greater leader than Moses in the Bible other than Jesus. I mean, I just don't think there is one. I think Moses is the greatest leader in, in the book. I mean, he, I mean, there's the biggest group of people, probably the most difficult task. I mean, trying to get millions of people through the desert, you know, with no food and water, fleeing from, a, you know, and the, 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 you know, the greatest power on the earth at that time, you know, until God took care of them. You know, he's a great leader, you know. I mean, if you've ever tried to, to corral people, get people to do something, it's like herding cats. It can get crazy. You know, you just got to learn to go with the flow eventually. 
right? But Mo, I mean, that's why I give, you know, I tip my hat to Moses. I mean, he was a great leader. But he started out very humbly, right? That was, but it's interesting that he starts out in Oreb, and then when he's exalted and magnified in front of the people is in that same place where he was humbled. He returns to Oreb as a great leader and was magnified. Look at Exodus 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. We got a taste of that last night, right? And a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to do what? See what God's doing with me. Do you see how great I am? How great I've become in your sight. Ah, just this megamaniacal, just egomaniac. Just, just give me all the praise. No, he brought the people out to this great sight to do what? To meet with God. He said, hey, let's go meet God. And God, yeah, he used Moses in a great way, didn't he? Very, very powerful. Go over to 1 Corinthians 1. I should have had you stay there. He used him in a great way. I mean, I mean, the thundering, the lightning, you know, and, and I mean, Moses later comes down, his face is shining, right? Because he spent so much time in the mount with God and the people feared to look on him. I mean, obviously he was exalted in their sight to some degree, but that's not what Moses was in it for. He wasn't in it to, to exalt himself. He was in it to do what? To bring forth the people out of the what? To do what? To meet God. That's what, you know, leadership, at least within the local church and in our homes is about. It's about getting people to know God. And it's not about us. It's, you know, it's not about the preacher. It's not, it's not about you and, you know, as a person in any capacity as a leader. It's not about you. It's about serving other people. And it was specifically in the church, it's about, hey, we're trying to meet with God here. You know, I'm trying to introduce us to the Lord, trying to help us to get to know the Lord better through his word and through the preaching of his word. You go into 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just start in verse 27, but God, we read this, I know, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the, 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 the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to not the things that are, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You know, God is all these things to us, not some man. God is who, is who we need to get to know. Verse 31, that as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Like, if, 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 you know, if there's anything I want people to glory in in this church, it's the Lord. It's in his word. It's not in me. You know, it's not in some earthly vain accomplishment that has my name attached to it. It's I want people to glory in the Lord in this church. That's what I'm concerned about. You know, that's what we should all be concerned about. But that's going to take humility. And in whatever degree you're going to serve the Lord, you know, you have to have humility. And we're all going to serve God. It's not like this is the only place you can serve God. In fact, you know, you can do just as great a work, if not greater works, out there for God. You know, I'm not downplaying this role. It's important. Someone's got to do it. But the fact is, you don't have to be behind this pulpit to do great works for God, to be a leader for God. But I am saying this, if you want to lead for God, if you want to be somebody that God's going to use, you have to have humility. And you have to, you know, and if you can't show that one to another, and the Bible's telling us to be clothed with humility, to, to treat one another with humility, to, to, to submit one to another, you know, I wonder how far you really are going to go with the Lord, how far you will take it. <clears throat> because here's the thing, you know, any, any wisdom that, that comes across this pulpit any wisdom that we share with our families, any wisdom that we impart to other people that's of any eternal value, it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. God's the one that gives grace. God's the one that gives wisdom. So, you know, if you desire to be used by God this morning, and I trust that's everybody in the room. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to do something with my life, I want God to, I want it to be to the glory of God. And if that's you, if you want to be desired, if your desire is to, to be used by God, then you have to learn humility. You have to accept the fact that there are humble beginnings. And you don't get to just jump to the head of the pack. You don't get to just immediately, you know, be in the limelight or whatever. That you have to learn the lessons of humility. You have to learn the lessons that come from hum humble beginnings. You know, and I've been talking a lot about individuals, but this really applies to us as a church. 
you know, if we want this church to grow and, 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 to, and to do more and more works for God, to knock all these doors and see soul saves and see lives changed, which to me is the most rewarding thing. It's very rewarding. You know, I, I, don't, I don't just look at this job as, you know, some burden that has to be endured. You know, I actually like preaching, if you can believe that. <laughs> you know, and why do I like it? Because I'm so good at it. <laughs> because it's rewarding. Because like I was saying earlier, God works and people change and the Lord moves. And that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of reward to that. It's very fulfilling. And if that's what we want as a church, then you know what? We have to accept our humble beginnings here. We have to accept that, you know, we're in the small space, we're a smaller group, but God can still use us. And if we'll stick with that and not just get discouraged, not get disgruntled and quit on the church, you know, God will build upon that and exalt us and, and as a body. So if you want to be used by God, you got to learn by humility. Why? Because humility, you know, those are the, those are the beginnings of service. Humility is the beginning of all this. It's the beginning of service. It's the beginning of submission. It's the groundwork for effective leaders. Let's go ahead and pray.